Without objection. Mr. President, I rise today to speak about our persistent global security crisis. But I also want to connect how our national debt crisis um, affects that. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the victims' families of these tragic events of the last three weeks, Mr. President. Just this week, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee hosted the French ambassador to the United States. And in that meeting, we shared our thoughts that uh, our prayers are with them and with the people of France. But more than that, we stand in, stand in solidarity with them against these evil forces that manifested themselves on the streets of Paris just this past week. The horrific ISIS attacks in Paris, killing more than 130 people and injuring more than 350 people, mostly men, women, and some children, serve as a chilling reminder of the threat we continue to face from international terrorism every day. Earlier this week, Russia confirmed that, in fact, it was indeed a terrorist bomb that took down a Russian airliner over the Sinai Peninsula, killing all 224 people aboard. And just last night, we saw two Air France planes, thank God, under a false uh, alarm, be grounded because of fear of some terrorist attack. In addition, ISIS has now claimed responsibility for twin suicide attacks in Beirut just last week, killing 43 more people. This makes three international attacks in three short weeks. ISIS continues to be a persistent threat to the West and to the security and stability in the Middle East. Unfortunately, as they have already said several times, these attacks only confirm what ISIS has in mind for the future. ISIS has indeed been very clear about their intention to bring their version of terrorism to our own backyards here in America. Indeed, ISIS even threatened Paris-style attacks on our nation's capital in a recent video this week. Earlier this week, CIA Director John Brennan said he would not consider the Paris attacks a one-off event. Director Brennan went on to say, and I quote, it's clear to me that ISIL has an external agenda and that they are determined to carry out these types of attacks. I would not anticipate that this is the only operation that ISIL has in the pipeline, end quote. In light of the latest attacks by ISIS, beyond Iraq and Syria, by the way, I could not disagree more with our president, who says that his policies are indeed containing ISIS. The president and his administration continue to underestimate this threat. They even called on the JV team not too long ago. Despite the fact that ISIS has demonstrated its ability to penetrate large-scale attacks or perpetrate large-scale attacks beyond the borders of its so-called caliphate, President Obama refuses to change this failed strategy. Beyond the fault here, beyond the fault of the president, however, fault lies here in Congress as well. It's, we're all involved in this. Washington is entirely too often focused on the crisis of the day instead of getting at the true underlying problems and solving them directly. It shouldn't take a tragedy like this for Washington to pay attention. Again, the latest terrorist attacks only underscore that we are facing a global security crisis of increasing magnitude. And this is inextricably linked to our own national debt crisis. As a matter of fact, the biggest threat to our global security is still our nation's own federal debt. This is a true, as true today as it was when Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 2012, Admiral Mullen, said the same thing. In the past six years, Washington has spent $21.5 trillion running the federal government. Mr. President, that's so large, I have a hard time even grasping how significant that is. But what I can understand is this. Of that $21.5 trillion that we spent running the federal government, we've actually borrowed $8 trillion of that $21.5 trillion. That's a tragedy of proportion we've never seen in America before. With over $100 trillion of future unfunded liabilities, on top of the $18.5 trillion we've already built up, this is about $1 million for every household in America. Every family in America today shares in this responsibility of about $1 million per family. We are so far past the tipping point, we may be at a point of being unmanageable, Mr. President. If interest rates alone were at their 
30-year average of 5.5%, of we would already be paying over a trillion dollars in interest. That's unmanageable, Mr. President. That's twice what we spend on our, our defense investment. It's twice what we spend on our discretionary non-defense investment. It's unmanageable. And we're well past that tipping point. Yet Washington's own dysfunction in gridlock is keeping us from completing the budget process as I speak today and passing appropriations bills here in the Senate. I, I might even argue, Mr. President, we may have seen the last truly voted upon and approved appropriation bill in the Senate because of the abuses of the rules that we see both sides have played in recent years. Only four times, shockingly, in the last 40 years, only four times, Mr. President, has the budget process, along with the authorization process, along with the appropriation process, only four times in the last 40 years has that process worked the way it was designed as it was written in the law in 1974 in, this budget, in the budget law. For example, this year we have tried to get onto the defense budget. That means that we're trying to take the appropriations bill that would fund the defense so we can go defend Americans abroad and we can defend our, our interests here at home against threats like ISIS. And we are being blocked from even getting that bill, which passed with a vast majority of votes in committee, from getting to the floor for a vote. No less than three times have the people on the other side of the aisle blocked that from going to the floor for debate, amendment process, and a vote. And three times the Democrats have voted against allowing us to get that defense budget onto the floor, thus making it a political football. It's something I just really don't understand, not being of the political process here and trying to get accustomed to how this, this works. I just don't understand that, Mr. President. We have these recent attacks from ISIS, and yet we can't even find consensus here in this body to fund our Defense Department. William Few, the very first senator from Georgia, in whose seat I serve today, would absolutely be appalled. He would remind us that in the United States Constitution, there are only six reasons why 13 colonies, of which Georgia was one, came together to form this miracle called the United States. One of those six reasons, Mr. President, was to, and I quote, provide for the common defense. And here we are, through dysfunction and partisan politics, not acting appropriately to fund the ability to provide for the common defense. I hope we can learn, Mr. President, from recent events and get serious about tackling this debt problem so we can use that resource to fund our strong foreign policy. And we need a strong foreign policy to fight these threats abroad. But to have a strong foreign policy, Mr. President, we have to have a strong military. We proved that in the 80s when we brought down the Soviet Union with the strength of our economy and the power of our ideas. But we are at risk today because of our own intransigence and this national debt. To have a strong military, though, as we proved, we have to have a strong economy. And that's in jeopardy because of this growing debt crisis. To confront this global debt crisis, we have to get serious today. We have to break through. We have to get shoulder to shoulder and defend our country, which means we have to do the dirty work here on the floor of the Senate and pass the funding so we can defend ourselves against these new threats. Now is the time, Mr. President, to solve this debt crisis so we can lead as a country again to deal with this global security crisis and provide for the safety of every American, wherever they are in the world. Thank you, Mr. President, and I, uh, I note the absence of a quorum.